Then first of all, before beginning this actual presentation, I want to use this opportunity uh, to say congratulations to the host, uh, Tudor Braniste, who just recently got married. Uh, congratulations. Sorry, I cannot say it in person to you. Hopefully in two years, we can meet again at the next uh, conference. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, my name is Leonard Siebert. I'm from the group of Rainer Adlung. Um, I'm doing currently my habilitation, and we are very interested in advanced uh, yeah, composite materials, and especially we're studying materials on the nano and micro scale. Um, I'm, I'm also involved with a lot of biomedical applications. The topic today I want to talk about is really interesting to us. Um, because it holds a lot of potential. I'm going to talk about interpenetrating composites. I think many of you have already heard of composites before. It's the combination of two types of materials. It can either be two polymers or you can include glass fibers into a polymer to make fiber reinforced uh, composite. But this special property of an interpenetrating composite is that you have two phases which are continuous. So here, for example, in this cube, you have the red face and the blue face and they interpenetrate each other. So you never have a rupture in one of the phases. Um, and this is quite a unique and interesting property a composite can have. Um, think of, for example, electrical conductivity. If you have now uh, the red face that is electrically conductive and the blue face would be an insulator, then still this whole material would be electrically conductive. This we have demonstrated, for example, by uh, fabricating um, aerogels, uh, out of graphene. Uh, these are some hollow uh, uh, channels that are coated with graphene on the inside and outside you have some type of hydrogel. So this whole hydrogel gets conductive just because these two things are an interpenetrating composite. But I'm not going to talk about conductivity. I'm just going to talk about the mechanical uh, interesting properties that some of these um, um, interpenetrating composites can have. So first of all, um, how do we actually fabricate uh, interpenetrating composites? So you can take, for example, a solid phase that has already such a porous structure that is interconnected with each other. Then you take something that first has a liquid phase, you can fill it inside. And then uh, when you can harden this liquid phase, then you get a composite where both of these phases interpenetrate each other. Unfortunately, this is not very nice to show in uh, 2D. Um, so I'm just going to show you the solid phase that we've used so you get a better understanding for how this is working. Um, this is now an SEM image of this um, melamine form aldehyde foam. Uh, this you can buy under the name Basotec. It's normally used for, um, um, for audio insulation. And uh, it's quite open porous, as you can see, and it forms this nice network of interpenetrating arms that are all connected to each other. So since this is very open porous, you can now fill this uh, with another type of material. If we want to learn something about uh, the mechanical properties of such a composite, it's of course very wise to first study the mechanical properties of the individual materials. And what you can do, for example, is now you take a cube um, of this um, foam material and you compress it. And what you then can see is the first time you compress it, it has quite a high uh, uh, modulus. So uh, the uh, slope here in the beginning is quite high. And then we, when you come back down and you compress it again, the modulus is uh, lower. So I have here a table where I have the cycle. So compression, decompression, compression, decompression. And you can see that the modulus, so this is the uh, slope here in the beginning, it's, it decreases over the number of cycles. So clearly something is happening to this material. And uh, what we did is we did some micro CT and we could then uh, make a really nice FEM simulation of this material. Um, I can show you this video briefly. I hope it looks as nice to you as it is to me. I can start it again. You can see this foam uh, nicely simulated. And the color here indicates now the stress that is arising or the deformation, if you will, inside the material. And so you can see when you press it from the right side, uh, then the stress is concentrated from the side that you press it. And the further you go on inside this material, the lower the stress is. We can also see this uh, from a static image. Um, and when you look here into this orange or kind of red uh, area, which is uh, the side from which it's compressed, then you can see that individual connections inside this network are being strained more than others. 
you can see, for example, this knot here is quite red, um, while this knot here is quite green. So this knot here uh, takes up a lot of the stress uh, that comes into the whole material. So the stress is not distributed perfectly equally, but it concentrates in some of these areas. So these are then likely to fail uh, because they are just subjected to higher stresses. And uh, this is probably the reason for why we see this type of lowering in the overall modulus because in the network, the more connections break, uh, the lower the overall contributions uh, to the stiffness of the network will be. But what you can also see that this somehow converges uh, onto one value, so it's not decreasing anymore after some time. And this means that all of the connections that have um, been stressed and broken uh, before, um, they are now not contributing anymore, but still you have a network in which all of the stress is distributed quite nicely. This depends, of course, on how much you compress this material, but this overall trend is quite nice to observe. So this is now some characterization you might do to such a network, but what about the other phase? Um, what you can do is you can take now, uh, for example, a silicone or another type of two component polymer, you can mix the individual component and it's the liquid and uh, after some time it solidifies because the polymer rises and it hardens. So this silicone that we've used here is called Ecoflex, it's one of the most uh, uh, flexible uh, silicones I know, so it can stretch it really far and you can see that uh, here you have a quite nice linear behavior and the compression over the whole range. So not as before here with this nonlinear behavior, but rather quite linear. This is to be expected from such an elastomer. What happens now if you combine these two uh, materials into one? So first of all, we kind of need to get the silicone inside this melamine foam sponge. Uh, and uh, this you would say, okay, it's quite easy, just pour it in, but it's of course never that easy. As you can see, it's really hard to fill out all of this material. You have to somehow get it to fill every nook and cranny and not leave any open spaces on the inside. So the technique that we have come up with is you take a small container. In this container, you can place a little bit of the sponge material, can place it inside this cavity. And then you have two parts of it. Um, here's a, a ceiling. And when you screw all of these together, then you have here a closed um, volume inside. Um, that you can uh, suck the air out of. So you apply a vacuum to this part. And then on from the top, from this side here, you can put a syringe that uh, still contains the liquid silicone. And what happens then after you've sucked the vacuum inside here, this is a three-way valve, you can turn it. And when you turn it, because there's a vacuum inside, the silicone will be sucked uh, from this syringe um, into this material and fill every cavity because there's no air inside currently. And by this uh, vacuum molding method, uh, you can also see that these holders are 3D printed. Um, you can uh, nicely uh, develop such composite materials and fill um, every nook. One uh, reason why it's hard to fill uh, these types of materials from the inside is that you get a lot of friction and turbulence uh, inside the materials. It's very hard to have laminar flow uh, inside these individual channels here, and this might be a reason why it's very difficult to fill from the outside. So uh, then you get such kind of composites, very nice, you can touch it, you can cut it and so on. Um, but the very nice thing about it is it's unusual behavior, because what you find, um, you can see here once more the curves for pure sponge material, so the foam, and then for the pure silicone and low compression range, these are both linear. But if you find this composite, uh, it has a modulus that is increased by a factor of two from the pure sponge. So this is quite unusual. You would say, okay, you have these two materials and you combine it should have approximately the same modulus. So why should it be twice as high? Um, and one reasoning for this might be uh, in its microscopic behavior. So what you can see is that this material is made out of these kind of rings. And for simplicity's sake, I'm now going to project it into 2D so you have an easier understanding of what's going on. So these individual rings are formed inside the material because of its structure. And um, when you compress it normally without being filled, then you can see uh, that this angle phi is increasing while this angle theta is decreasing. It depends on the compression direction, but this is in generally the case. So in these corners, it can change the angle and thus uh, give way for the compression to happen. 
Um, so when you compress it, then theta goes uh, down and phi goes up. But what happens now if you fill the inside with the silicone? The silicone is incompressible, so um, you cannot just uh, reduce this angle here or increase that angle because there's silicone in the way. So if you press on it, rather than uh, uh, deforming really, there is this type of force distribution on each of the individual arms, you know, the silicone is confined in this space. So if you deform it from the outside, all of the forces are transformed linearly into every one of these arms, like in a balloon, which you blow up. It also resists from its whole uh, structure. And since these are rather stiff here, the individual arms, this poses a force to the outside. This is quite an unusual behavior for such a micro system. But where we also know this from is from this type of packaging. Yeah, a package also doesn't fall apart because you wrap it quite tightly from the outside with the rope material in 3D. So you can compare this micro material to this macroscopic uh, known uh, form quite easily. Then another and maybe also the last uh, unusual point of this is when you already have it in a pre-compressed state when you fill in the silicone. Yeah, this is already compressed. I compress the sponge and then fill in the silicone. What happens is now you have this stiff axis. Okay, you say we know this. We have seen this on the last slide. So you can compress it more in this direction because these arms are stretched. But what also happens is that in all other directions, for example, from this side where it's not pre-compressed, it uh, behaves softly again. It behaves like the pure silicone as if there wasn't even uh, any interpenetrating composite going on. So I think this is quite interesting because then by the pre-compression from this material, you can change uh, how the mechanical properties are, not changing anything about the composition, but rather just how you fabricate it. And in this way, you can introduce a very nice anisotropy into this previously isotropic material. The reason is, of course, that in this direction, these angles here can bend, while these angles do not reduce themselves anymore. Um, and therefore, you do not put a stretch on these outer bondings here. So, okay, you can say now this is uh, all nice and good, but what is this interesting for? I want to show you a material that's very similar to this. This is cartilage as you find it, for example, in the knee or in other joints. And you can see that you have a very nice anisotropy uh, in parts of the material. So you have an anisotropy here and these fibers in the lower in the so-called deep zone. Here in the middle zone, it's uh, arranged any which way. So it's quite isotropic. And in this um, superficial tangential zone, it's completely uh, uh, in the other direction. So you could now fabricate uh, such type of material from this interpenetrating composite as I demonstrated by compressing it in different ways. So from the top, you could press it and from the side, you can press it from another side and therefore fabricate composites that have exactly this type of behavior. And with this, I'm already at the end uh, for this talk. This was a, a mechanical overview over such uh, um, yeah, interpenetrating composites. I hope you found it interesting and I'm really open for some questions now. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. So if there are any questions, please. Maybe I can ask you a short question. Yeah, sure. How do you know, or how do you, yeah, when, when you have um, filled in the iron material structure with, uh, with a polymer? Yeah. 100%, or maybe you can control uh, uh, the composite ratio. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is your question, whether you can control yeah. it. How do you, how do you measure? How do you, do you know? Uh, yeah, um, you know it. Uh, I can, for example, explain like this first experiment where we filled in uh, this material unsuccessfully. Then you can really see there's a cavity forming. Uh, maybe you can see it on this image. If you cut it from the inside, then it will still be hollow. Uh, in any other way, if you're looking for micropores and such, we can investigate such, such things on the SEM. But what we have done before to just characterize the sponge is doing micro CT. In micro CT, you take the difference in density. And with this, you would also be able to see uh, micro cavities inside if there's some air missing. Uh, but we didn't observe this, so I'm quite confident that it's filled uh, with 100% of the polymer. Okay, and, and uh, are different filling factors influence the mechanical properties? 
Um, yes, of course, if you have still the air inside, then you can maybe also tailor some of the mechanical properties, because as you uh, have seen before, uh, the uh, modulus is lower when you do not have any silicone inside this material. And then if you have, for example, 50% only filled and 50% would be still air, then I would suspect that the material is 50% as uh, soft as uh, yeah, the uh, uh, full filled composite. But I don't know if it actually would behave this linearly. This is something we could investigate. Okay. Good. Thank you. Then thank you very much for your presentation.